The second type of distance is called cost distance. And cost distance is used to create least cost paths through geographic space. The cost distance tools are similar to Euclidean distance tools. But instead of calculating the actual distance from one location to another for every cell in geographic space, the cost distance tools determine the shortest weighted distance back to the source cell or cells. And these tools apply distance and cost units rather than geographic units of Euclidean distance. The first thing we require to undertake or create a cost weighted distance raster is a cost raster. So this is different from the cost weighted distance raster, which we'll talk about soon. The cost raster is an input to this cost weighted distance raster. The cost raster itself is produced using a type of multi-criterion evaluation. It's just like a suitability model. The difference being that there is a uniform measurement system used to standardize one or more input rasters to create that cost distance raster, or I should say just cost raster, not distance raster. So the unit or the standardized measurement system could be dollars. Think about the idea of figuring out how to make a new road from point A to point B in geographic space. Well, there would be costs in dollar amounts that you could associate with traveling a specific distance, depending on the type of land cover or land use or geology, geology that you're um, traversing across each cell. And so dollars could be a standardized way to measure the cost of traveling through geographic space. But there must be some standardized measure, just like in multi-criterion evaluation, such that the value of each cell within the cost raster is assumed to represent the cost per unit distance of passing through the cell, where distance here corresponds to the cell width, either um, cardinally or diagonally. And again, these costs could be travel time, that's one idea, dollars, anything that you can conceive of that's relevant to determining how um, easy it might be or how not easy it might be to travel through a particular location or cell in geographic space. Once we have a cost raster, we can use the cost the distance function in Python or the cost distance tool in our toolbox to create a least accumulative cost raster in which each cell then has assigned to it the minimal cost to get back to the source. Let's look at an example. So we might have a cost raster here which is composed of a direct or weighted linear combination of standardized input rasters where the standardization scale could be meters, it could be dollars, it could be some ranked system or some scale by function system. As long as the cost one here in let's say the um, uh, reclassified slope is the same as a cost one here and it may not exist in that one at all. But a four here is the same as four here in terms of the cost of travel through a cell due to either land use or slope. So these equivalencies, just like with multi-criterion evaluation and standardization, are fundamental. So there's really no big difference here, except we're talking about now movement through a cell, and everything must be in terms of cost. So that each value represents an impedance to flow through the cell. Um, you could think of the idea of slope, for example, just slope by itself and water flow. Well, water doesn't flow upwards and it flows more quickly when you have a steeper slope than when you have a very flat slope. Or not a completely flat slope, but you know, a, a very shallow slope, I should say. And so slope itself could be a measure of cost 
if you were to model, let's say, water flow over the landscape so that each cell would have an impedance based on the magnitude of the slope. The higher the slope, the smaller the impedance. The lower the slope, the higher the impedance to water flow. So we have input layers that create the cost raster. And this can also be weighted. So we might have slope, let's say, here, and land use. And we can weight each layer differently as long as the sum of the weights equals 1, where W sub i here is a weight. So those sum to 1, as you can see. So that's the same, again, as a um, weighted linear combination in multi-criterion evaluation. So in this particular case, slope is considered more of an impedance than is land use to the objective or question at hand in terms of uh, flow through each cell. Once we have our individual standardized layers, we add them together. Or you could multiply them depending on what you're doing, but this is an example of just addition. So we use the map algebra to add two layers together to create what's called the total cost surface, or just cost raster. So often it's called total cost raster. And so that's another name you might hear for it. But it's just the same as cost raster. What is called total cost raster is often in the context of explaining that each of these are, for example, each of these individual ones, A and B here, are cost rasters. And then the sum of them is the total cost. But in any case, we'll just call it a cost raster. And on the cost raster, you should be able to predict for purposes of eva uh, uh, validation what the minimum and maximum values might be. So you look at the minimum value and the maximum value across all the rasters. And you can then think, OK, well, if you're adding them together, what should the minimum and maximum be? So for example, in this particular case, we have in the first raster 1.32. And then the maximum value in both of these rasters is, well, in the one raster and in the second raster, the maximum value is 2.04. So 1.32 plus 2.04 would be the uh, theoretical max, maximum output value. So that would be a 23.36. Or oh, sorry, no, the um, I was doing that wrong. Uh, my apologies. Uh, the maximum value would be based on the, the theoretically maximum value based on the maximum values of each input raster. So in this case, 3.96 plus 2.04. So our our um, theoretical maximum value coming out based on just the, the, the values in the input rasters would be uh, 2.04. So that would be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So we could have the possibility of a 6 coming out. The minimum values would be based on, or the theoretical minimum, would be based on the um, 2 lowest values of the input the lowest of the sum of the lowest values across the input rasters so in our case here the smallest one here is 1.32 smallest one here is 0 0.34 so that's 1.32 plus 0 0.34 and that's equal to 661.66 so 1.66 would be the theoretical minimum and we actually see that occurring right there and right there and right there. We don't see the maximum occurring. It doesn't mean there has to be a maximum like that, but we know it can't be more than that. And so knowing these things is important because then you can 
see whether or not you've done the correct type of operation so that you can know what to expect and that way you're kind of looking at it and testing whether or not what you expect to happen actually happens. And that's fundamentally important as a means of trying to validate any step of a model that you're doing. Validation is very important because you won't always get, as we know, an error just because you've done something wrong. You have to know whether you've done something wrong. So once we have that cost raster together, then ArcGIS Pro can use the cost distance function and an algorithm called Dijkstra's algorithm. And it's described in good detail with a fully worked example in the help file for um, the cost distance function. So if you want to know more about it, have a look there. And that basically produces from the cost surface a cost weighted distance surface. Here's an example of what it might look like. Where each cell, no matter where you uh, decide to put your, or you decide to land on, like right here, well, that 6.4 is the least costly way total, so that's a total now, the least costly total of getting back to the source here. Okay, and 10.5 is the least costly from getting from the least costly way of getting from, or the, the, the sum, the total, is the least costly total to get back from that cell here to the source over here. Now, it doesn't show us which way to go or anything like that. We need a second raster for that. Um, and it's not always a straight line because we're not talking about Euclidean distance anymore. All we know is that every cell on a cost-weighted distance raster tells us the value that represents the least costly way of going back to the source from that cell. With the cost-weighted distance raster, we also compute what's called a cost direction raster. The cost direction raster says or tells you for any given cell that you choose what the next cell is on the least costly path back to the source. So for example, if I land on this cell here, four, four is a direction, and that direction means southwest. So that's this cell here. And then this cell is also a four, and that's southwest there. And so that means the least cost path from four back to the source, or from the, I should say, the top right corner cell right here, back to the source is this way. If you choose a different cell, like this one, five means west, so west, and then this next one is also a five, and west gets you back to here. So that's the least costly path if you choose that cell here. Um, if I chose this cell, four, so four is southwest, that goes from, that goes to here now, and then five west goes to here. So for that particular cell, the least cost path is that, back to the source. And those uh, directions, the numbers that represent each direction, are just given in this little um, legend here, so you know what they are. Once we have the cost direction raster, also called a backlink raster, so that's another name for it, that's the raster that's required to determine the actual path. If you're interested in finding a path from, let's say, point B back to point A in the least costly possible way, well, this gives you that physical path because it's the one that's uh, capable of joining the cells together to get back to the source. Modeling trail emplacement in Gatineau Park. This is similar to an example by Reese 2004 of least cost path in mountainous terrain. And this is a good example to understand least cost path because it is very intuitive as to um, what cost means in the context of a trail. We're, we know that there's a trail called Trail 24 in Gatineau Park. And it just goes from this trail junction to that trail junction. It's the red line shown right here. 
And this is considered an easy trail. So an easy trail generally should traverse the minimum amount of slope, for example, because it's very costly to go uphill and also even going down steep hills. So steep hills should be avoided as much as possible for an easy trail. And that's kind of the difference between an easy trail and a hard trail or an expert trail is the type and magnitude of slopes that you traverse. Can we put together a number of different factors or important factors that could lead us to understand the decision made in determining the emplacement or creation of this particular trail, this easy trail, trail 24. In other contexts, this same type of analysis has been done in things like archaeology. So in archaeology, the determination of roads is very important because on roads you can find trade routes as well as finding artifacts from stations on the roads, camps along the roads, etc. So in the context of archaeological prospecting, I would say, some researchers have found roads, ancient trade routes, by using least cost path analysis to determine where a road might be in space, and then they can go and search for it, or at least narrow down the region in which they're searching for the in place uh, where a road was in place between, let's say, two ancient settlements or something like that. Particularly in European uh, archaeology, this is used frequently. So the idea of least cost path analysis doesn't just have to be about minimizing slope, but you could use different cost variables uh, to recreate a thought process. And that's kind of what we're doing here. Before we undertake our analysis, we have a layer called Trail 24 DEM for digital elevation model. It's a raster layer. Ensure that you set all your environment options, the critical ones here, to match Trail 24 DEM. And you know, you can read them here and you know how to do that by now. You could also do that in Python or just let the Python environment um, inherit from the global environment, the application level environment settings. So in our first example here, we're just considering slope. The idea that for an easy trail, it should be emplaced in such a way that it minimizes the amount of slope that would have to be covered or traversed by someone going on that trail between junction A and junction B in space. So we start with a trail 24 DEM and we get a slope layer. And slope you can think of as a direct cost for walking a trail. So we get slope from our DEM, and that then becomes our cost. So plain old slope, the value of slope, becomes the cost. And that then goes into a cost distance function to create the least, or to create the cost weighted distance surface. So we put in cost and the source, which would be one of our junctions. So in this example, A is the source here. And so we say cost distance, and it creates both the cost distance layer, so that's the layer that shows for each cell, which is the least accumulative cost of going from anywhere in space back to junction A right here. So that's our cost weighted distance surface. And it also creates at the same time the backlink raster or cost direction raster. For every cell, it has a value such as we've seen already, four meaning southwest or five meaning west, etc. And for every cell, you can pick any cell and then follow to the next to the cell, to the next cell, to the next cell, all the way back to the source, which is junction A, to get a least cost path. The cost path tool requires both of those inputs, and that produces an actual path, which is the least costly way of getting from junction B back to junction A based just on slope. In Python, map algebra, we do the same thing. Again, I mentioned before, we'll start with our DEM variable, which is just a raster variable of trail 24 DEM. And then we put that into slope right there. So DEM goes into slope and that gives us our cost surface. So plain old slope is our cost. Then we have our start location junction A. So that's the source. And we use the cost and the start location in the cost distance function. So the start is our source and cost is the 
cost surface or total cost surface. Cost distance then produces cost distance 2A, and that is the cost weighted distance surface, and it's just called here cost dist 2A. Then we to get the cost direction, we use the cost backlink function with start and cost. So it's exactly the same order of arguments and same arguments as cost distance that we see here above. And we'll call that backlink to A as a raster variable. Then we have a particular location in space that we want to find the least cost path back to A from, and that's just junction B. And we'll call it destination, which is probably not the best word for it, but we'll call it destination. Once we have that, we have these three now necessary things for creating a cost path. And so we use cost path with the destination, the cost distance to A, and the backlink layer. And we ask for the best single least cost path. And we want the path to just take on an object ID. So there are different ways, depending on how big your source region is, you could find multiple cost paths back to every part of the source region. Let's say it's a parking lot, for example. So it would be more than a single cell. And so you may want to find multiple cost paths back to that parking lot to every part of that parking lot every cell along its boundary and that's possible but we just want the best single one and once we do that path from b to a then represents a linear feature represented in raster such as we see here so the green line the bright green line well and you can see it's quite rastery because it is just a set of cells right each cell along the least cost path back to the source. And this is going from junction B to junction A. So traveling in this direction. And it does some funky things here where it's walking almost like a switchback type of uh, movement along the contours or lines of uh, equal elevation because it's a little bit steeper right there to get up to junction A. So it tries to avoid that in other words the the total length here would be very large but that length is still less costly than going from let's say this part of the trail directly to junction a and of course uh, a we're not talking the grand canyon here so someone who created the trail between junction b and junction a if it was just based on slope wouldn't have this switchback type of uh, movement going back uh, to get up to junction A. They would just, you know, traverse it the way it is right now. So we see one thing here is that based on the slope model we have, our predicted least cost path doesn't match up with the actual one. It's kind of a little bit to the west. Not so far to the west as this intermediate trail here, which is the other green area, the other green trail. Um, but not completely where the other one is. And there could be other reasons for that, right? There could be multiple reasons why slope is not the only thing that was considered here. So the person who made that trail did not simply consider slope. Although slope is not a bad approximation, and if we just wanted to consider slope, we would find a probably a better path the way we have it here. And we call that B to A. So that line, because it goes from junction B to the source A, and the source is the one that was made when using or creating the cost weighted distance surface. So we call that path B to A. Uh, this is what it would look like in uh, 2.5 dimensions. And we can see here that it's um, you know, trying to, because it's going from B in this direction back to A here, that's A and that's B, it goes straight down that steep slope because it's very not costly to go straight down the slope. But as soon as it encounters any significant slope, even a mild slope, uh, such as from here back to A, and we can see it's mostly green, so it's not very steep, it starts to do that switchback motion to get to A in order to avoid um, cost penalties. So in this case, our predicted path is not exactly the same as the real one. And you can see the real path here um, it's the thin black line right there. And it's going over, you know, some steeper slopes down here 
and then kind of straight up that way. So it's almost like a one switch back and then a little bit of a um, straight line. So what if we look at the least cost path from A to B? So we reverse it. So in this case, our start or source is junction B. And that's the only difference here. It's all the same code otherwise that we just saw. Well, that would produce the red line here. So if we were going from A to B, uh, much of the same path, much of the path is the same, except we avoid that switchbacking here because it's not costly at all to go down slope. And we get a better looking path, um, certainly, than we do from, with, from B to A. So the only difference here is the bright green that you see, which is that switchbacking that happened. Otherwise, it's on the same path as the um, from B to A. So from A to B and B to A are the same except for that switchbacking. To undertake least cost path analysis, you can see here that I've brought in my Trail24 DEM, the water layer, which is off right now, on, off, junction A, which is in blue over here, and junction B, which is in yellow up here. So I want to use slope as the first layer that would be looked at in terms of the least accumulative cost surface from junction A, such that from junction B to junction A, the algorithm will minimize the amount of slope, the total amount of slope covered or traversed in getting back to A down here. And that would be called the least cost path from B to A. Just to give a better idea of how things look here, I'm just using in Surface, Spatial Analyst Tools, Surface, Hillshade, and I'll just make a quick Hillshade of the Trail24 DEM with a Z factor of 5. The Z factor is called a vertical exaggeration, and you can read about it here. So it, when it's greater than one, it makes the height relative to the distance larger and therefore exaggerates the height because there's not a lot, of, um, a lot of relief in this region to look at. So I'll make it like that. So there's the hillshade. And on the hillshade, we can see um, shadows. So in this case of the hillshade, the sun is from the northwest to the southeast corner. So the sun is shining or rised above the horizon in the northwest corner. And we can see that on some slopes we have, or hills in relief, you have sunny sides and then not sunny sides. And where you have very steep relief on the um, leeward side of the sun, you have dark patches, which here are just shadows, the mottled shadows. And so it gives us a better idea of what the relief in the region looks like. I could um, also click on model shadows here, and I'll just run it again, for example. And it might look a bit different with the modeled shadows, like so. Not too much different, but the model shadows then give, you know, these zero values to the shadow areas. So if you have that on, you can read about it there. So zero representing the shadow areas and 255, the brightest areas. So I'm going to turn that back off and just run that again. Just wanted to show you what model shadows does. So it's a way to, if you wanted to extract all the values that were zero, for example, as areas that are in shadow, if you were doing some sort of application that required understanding the amount of light, let's say that would be shining at a particular time of day. So there we go, we're back to the regular one. So we have dark values for shadows, but they're not necessarily zero everywhere. And light values for areas that are facing the sun and gray values for areas on the leeward side of the sun that aren't necessarily overly um, steep in terms of the relief. So we have that hill shade just to visualize, and that's all it's here for. The hill shade is just for visualization. Now I'm going to go to my analysis and then environments and change all my critical factors to match Trail24 DEM. 
So trail 24 DEM for coordinate system, extent, trail 24 DEM, snap raster, trail 24 DEM, cell size, 24 DEM, mask, trail 24 DEM, and I'll click OK. So everything's now matched up to trail 24 DEM rather than the previous settings. Then I'll open up Python. This is my first session, let's say. So I'll do my imports again. So I'll say from arcpy.sa import all, and then from arcpy import env, and then I'll check my environment settings, env.cellsize, and it should say um, trail 24 DEM. Good, env.snapraster. Let's check a couple of those. Trail 24 DEM, that's great. And env.extent, it won't say trail 24 because it's an extent object, but we should see extent object. There we go. So that means the global or application level environment settings have been passed down to the Python window. So now I'll start, I'll make DEM, and I'll just say that's equal to a raster variable made of trail 24 DEM. And our first initial cost or model for the least accumulative cost surface will be based on just the slope of the DEM. So slope DEM. And there's the slope model. So the slope is uh, telling us where it's steep and where it's less steep. So there's big shallow or even areas in here. So non-steep. And then as we go, um, just move this over a bit more, between junction B at the top to junction A at the bottom, you can see that we'd have to go through if we just tried to draw a path based on minimizing slope with our eyes, well, we probably have it going straight through here, just kind of with my mouse is going here, and then maybe around that area, through there as much as possible. And there's a bit of a slope here to go up and then up here. And that's where here, you can see there's steep slope, a little bit steep slope again, just in that last little bit to get here. And so that's where that switchbacking happens because of that slope. So it tries to go evenly around it rather than straight through. So we have our cost, which is the slope of the DEM, which we just uh, saw. Next, I'm going to take my um, source location, which is junction A and just store it in a variable. So I'll say source equals Junction A, and I'll just drag and drop it in there. So this is a reference to Junction A. And our other point, which is the, we'll just call it the from point equals Junction B. Because we're gonna go from Junction B to Junction A along a least cost path initially. So we have source and from point. Next, I can now make a cost distance surface. And I'll start by making the cost distance to A, since A will be the source here. So I'll call it cost distance dist to A, and that will be equal to cost distance, then the source location and the cost layer. And it'll go fairly quickly here. And if we just look at that layer to get an intuitive idea of what it's showing us, again, for any cell on this layer, that cell, if so, if I click here, for example, that's the total slope that has to be traversed to get back to, from that point, back to junction A down here. And that's the minimum amount of slope. So no matter where I click, it represents the minimum amount of slope that has to be traversed to get back to junction A. If I click over here, it doesn't matter where I click, it's the same thing, 999 slope units would have to be traversed, and that's the minimum amount to get back to junction A. So it's along the least cost path. So every cell in here is a least is produced by finding a least cost path back to junction A, right here, the blue one, along a least cost path. And that's why every cell represents the least accumulative cost distance of getting from that cell back to junction A. I also need to make my uh, cost direction raster. So I'll call that, I'm gonna call it backlink. 
equals or backlink 2a equals cost backlink and then the same thing in here source cost because we need both of those for the cost path function and again the cost backlink for every cell it has a value and that value represents the direction along the least cost path to the next adjacent cell along that least cost path for any cell. And it tells us in the legend here automatically what those might be. So, uh, for example, bright yellow means right. So right is the same as east. So if I click there, the value is um, one and one means right. So if I click on that cell, then I know I go to the rightmost cell, and that's along the least cost path. That next cell is also right, so there's a bunch of rights, until I hit a blue cell over here, and that's a three, so that means down. And so with this backlink raster alone, we can find what the least cost path is in space. We don't need the cost or cost distance raster. It's only required in the function in order to get a actual value for the cost path to measure the uh, total accumulative cost. But the backlink is all you need to get the physical path itself. So going back up here, now I'm going to use my uh, cost path to get a co least cost path and I'll say path from B to A equals cost path, cost path. And then in here, we have the destination data, the from point. Then we have our cost, least accumulative cost distance surface or our cost distance surface that we just made, which is cost dist to A. Then our backlink raster, backlink or cost direction raster, backlink to A. And then we can choose here best single, each cell or each zone. So the best single is generally what you want when you want the least cost path. If you have multiple cells in your source zone or in your destination zone, so let's say our junction B was a region then we might want the best single one from that region because in fact each cell in the region has its own least cost path back to the source. Many of them would be very similar, but the best single one would be the one with the minimal cost for all cells within that region. So I want best single. And then I can put the destination field here and I'll call it um, object ID. I think um, junction A, just let's check junction B here for the ID. Make sure we got the right name for the field. Yeah, object ID. So I was just checking the table um, to say what particular um, attribute value that I want to have assigned to the least cost path and it's object ID. Because I could have multiple destinations again or multiple, you know, I could have junction B, C, E, and I want to, I want to find all the paths, the best paths back. And I want something to tell me which paths belong to which of the destinations. And that's the object ID. I'll spell it exactly that way in all capitals though. Object ID, there we go. And that's it, then I can hit enter. Then we have a result. Now it's hard to see the result right now because uh, everything else is on. So I'm just gonna turn everything off. I'm gonna collapse everything. I'm going to turn on my junction A and junction B, and then the path from B to A is right there. So it's just in green right now, and I might want to make it red so it stands out more, or that, it should, that one should be red. There we go. Okay. And also put on my um, hill shade. Kind of see where that goes, or actually the slope makes more sense as well. We put on the slope value or the cost layer. So, okay, so here it decided to go in terms of slope, it went up here and then 
over this flat area, which is one all one color, and then here, and then straight down that steep slope, because going down a slope is not very costly. And then through this flat area here as much as possible, then it turns right. And it goes through all this flat area here back to the source. And in this case, there was no switchbacking that took place. That was just the example in the slides, probably because I had the junction a little bit different in the, when I made the slides, the location of it, for example. But this is a, then a straight up least cost path and we can compare that too. If I go to my catalog, we can compare it to trail 24 by bringing in trail 24 and seeing if it's similar. And we can see it's not exactly where trail 24 is. Trail 24 goes through this area of uh, variable relief in the middle quite a bit. It takes the same type of strategy in the flat areas that goes, once it gets to the flat area, it goes straight, more or less straight through flat area back to the source, that other junction. I could also bring it in all the trails if I want that context as well. So there's all the trails in that region. And in fact, the trail 24 isn't very precise. So there we go. There's the actual trail 24 right there. So what we can surmise from this is that the person who created this trail 24 didn't base their um, direction or their path just on slope alone. So we might think of other factors that we could take into account about this region. So for example, if I was to turn on water right now, and I'll bring water up to the top, right there, well, we didn't take into account water when we tried to make this first path. It was just slope. And of course, uh, water has zero slope because it's always um, level with, the, with gravity. So there's no slope to water. And so our path actually went over and through two large water areas, as you can see there. And it probably shouldn't be allowed to do that. It should try to uh, avoid water as much as possible because it costs extra money to build the infrastructure for the path over water features like these small lakes versus let's say avoiding them altogether and going just through a very um, narrow part of water like a stream or something would be less costly. And likewise you can see that with the existing Trail 24 it follows the water a bit but then it just goes over it very quickly in a very narrow area and then back. It doesn't try to go over the water directly um, in a large width region because it probably wouldn't be possible depending on the size of the lake and it wouldn't be advisable in that case. So it'd be quite expensive to build a causeway just for a trail. And I can just measure like how long that is for example. So yeah, so that these are small, very small uh, lakes like 118 meters across here approximately. But even that would be require a, quite, a, quite a bit of construction for a small easy trail in Gatineau Park. So how do we take water into account? Well, we have to give it a value, some sort of cost value. And that cost value has to be fairly high. If it's not high, it won't be avoided. Um, if it's too high, it'll be completely avoided altogether. And it will always take, we could have a path that goes all the way around these water features back to the source. But generally you wanna give a fairly good value, a high value to water. And that means combining water into our cost layer in some way. So to start with water, I'm going to give or create a, just a raster variable from the water. So I'll just call it water and that will be equal to raster water. No, not W. It's gonna give me an error here. That was just an accident, raster water. So now I have a raster variable for water. Then I'm gonna change my slope variable as well to percentage. So that the slope, instead of going from zero to the theoretical maximum of 90 degrees, it will go between zero and 100 as a percent rather than as a um, degree. And to do that, 
I'm just going to recreate my slope cost. So I'll say slope cost. Since I'll have multiple factors in this particular layer, I'll call it slope cost now instead of just plain old cost. And that'll be equal to slope of the DEM. And then comma here as percent rise rather than degree. Degree is the default that we've been using all along. We want percent rise. There we go. It's not going to actually look different as slope, but the values are now different and they range from zero to 100% slope instead of zero to 90 degrees. And that way I have something that ranges from zero to 100 and I could then utilize that information to figure out what water should be, let's say, as a cost. So for water, I might think that the cost should be related to the maximum amount for water. So it's avoided whenever possible in the computation of the least cost path. And to do that, I have to reclassify water. And so I have to use the, firstly, to reclassify something, I have to make a remap value, which is again, a list of lists, if you recall. So I'll make a remap value object. I'll just call it RCL. And that'll be equal to remap value. And here I have a list of lists. So I'll make my list outer list first. And then I'll have two values that I want here. It's either water or it's not water. If it's not water, then it should just be zero. If it is water, I want to give it a cost of 100. So that basically non-water has no effect on the other variables. So if it's non-water, then slope is the, it'll just be based on slope alone. If it is water, it becomes the maximum value of 100. So my first list in here will be zero to, I'll remap zero to zero, and then one to 100. Because these are the values in the water layer. See zero and one, zero is non-water and one is water. So zero will become zero and one will become 100. And I'm using remap value rather than range here because this is a non-continuous variable. It's a categorical layer with two classes, not water and water. So that uses a remap value. Whereas in the previous um, module, we were using remap range. Remember converting, for example, um, classes one, two, and three from growing degree days, temperature above zero degrees Celsius. You know, so we had a range, let's say, of zero to 158 as being one, and then 158, 158 to 200 being two, and then 200 and greater being three. And that's a, uh, we're remapping a range there of values. Here we're just going with a categorical layer, so we, use, we create a remap value function. Um, what did I miss there? As I was talking, I wasn't paying attention, and I, need, I, I used my outer list as the first item, but remember, it has to be a list of lists. And since I was talking at the same time, I wasn't paying attention to that. And I put in these two things without having them enclosed in a um, master list object. So remember, a list of lists. There we go. Then I can use reclassify. And I'll call the output water cost. And that will be equal to um, reclassify. Input will be water. And it's always going to be the value here. And it even shows up, I think, here. But yeah, there we go. Value is the field. And then my remap object, which is RCL, like so. And I hit enter. And now we can have a, I can have a look at water cost. So now it's 0 and 100 instead of 0 and 1. So water will be avoided as much as possible. That means we're not going to have a trail solution going through these thick parts of the water. It may try to avoid it altogether, or if it doesn't, it will go through a very thin part, depending on how the cost accumulates and what the least cost path is. So that's our old path there. So now I can create a, another cost, total cost layer, and I'll just call it T cost, and that will be equal to just the direct linear combination of the water factor, water cost, and slope cost, since they're now both on the same scale of things. So slope cost plus water cost. Now, because my, no, my new total cost, once I have that, 
my cost distance raster, and I'll call it uh, cost dist to a2. So we know it's a different one than the first one we made before. So cost dist to a2 will be the name of our cost distance. And I'll say cost distance, and in is the source data. And that's going to be our source. And then our cost raster, which is t cost in this case. And then we make a cost backlink after that. So I'll, I'll call that back link to a2. And that will be equal to cost backlink. And the same thing, our source and t cost. Now that I have my cost distance and my backlink layer, I can create the new least cost path based on these two uh, cumulative cost layers and one showing the, dis the directions from cell to cell along the least cost path. So I'll call the output path from B to A2. B to A2 equals cost path. And then the input is the destination. And that we called from PT. Then the cost distance raster, which is cost dist to A2. And the backlink, backlink to A2. Then the path type, best single. And the destination field again, object ID. Great, so I'll just close this for a second and now we can look at the new path and compare it to the old path. So that's our old path here. And the new path, and I'm gonna turn off that one and just keep that on. Cost distance, don't need that on either. I'm turning some of these off so we can see both things at the same time. And I don't like the fact that the new one is purple, so I'm gonna make it a different color like green. There we go. Okay, so what do we see here? We start from the same location and we go along the same least cost path for both solutions. The difference is once we hit that first lake. Once we integrate lakes with a high cost, the path veers around the lakes. And then it joins the uh, original path again that was just based on slope. But it goes down straight here in order to go over a very narrow part of the water. And then it comes back, veering, veering away from or just on the edge of the lake and then joins the same least cost path back to A. The reason I'm showing this in such detail is that the path should make sense and you should be able to explain why the path goes where it does based on how you've put cost into different things. And you only know that by studying it, by studying the path and looking at it, seeing what it's going over and what it's avoiding. And does that make sense based on the cost values that you included in your analysis. So it's very important to be able to do that, to understand the choice in the cost path. So in this case, the, the path, parts of the path certainly come closer to the actual Trail 24. But again, just lakes and slope alone don't explain the location of Trail 24. But what it does explain here is the fact that both Trail 24 and our um, least cost path, the second one, both go over narrow parts of the water. And so that was a decision, or likely is a decision, that was made in the construction of Trail 24 itself, was to avoid water, and if you have to go over it, go over a very narrow part of it. And so that starts to look good. So we're starting to understand or be able to get into the head, let's say, of the trail designer, the, the landscape art, architect or whoever created that particular trail. We could also integrate outcrops in there, but I'm not going to for this example. If you want to integrate outcrops, you can. Just look at the actual 